You know, I wonder, does uh, anyone in this room have idiots at your workplace? <laughs> so how many idiots can you think of right now? Don't say it out loud. If you need to use your fingers or even both hands, that's okay with me. Some of you might be thinking, I don't have any idiots at work. Well, my friends, that's when all the alarm bells should be ringing. <laughs> yes, because then it's probably you. <laughs> when I started talking about this topic eight years ago, the headline of my keynote was uh, how to become a great colleague. I wanted to put up a show, so I hired a huge venue, did PR, marketing, everything, you name it, and I sold four tickets. Why? Everyone assumed their callings were going, of course, but nobody saw the need to go themselves. So I renamed the show, same content, new title, The Idiots at Work. It was packed every night, sold out. So it turns out everyone has idiots at work, but it's never them. This was me 10 years ago. There was always something wrong with everyone else, not me. I had this one colleague who was driving me nuts. I've been working in the media industry for 30 years, most of them as a leader, and this guy was also a leader. Really smart guy, but cocky, arrogant, cynical, you name it. An idiot. The idiot. And one day we had this leadership training, and everyone had to stand up in front of the group and view ourselves as leaders, both strengths and weaknesses. And uh, my idiot was the first one to do this exercise. And uh, he said, well, my problem is that I'm an introvert, not all good with people, lack of empathy. I don't really see myself as a great leader. And then he said something that knocked me off my seat. He said, but if I have had more of the people skills that Per Henrik has, I would have been a complete leader. His words, not mine. I'm not a complete leader, far from it. But in that exact moment, he was no longer the idiot. <laughs> I was. I had never given this guy a fair chance. We were supposed to be a team. His strengths and my strengths complementing each other. But the only thing I saw was that I didn't like him because he was not like me. While he had embraced my strengths and skills, I had failed to appreciate his, and he became my turning point. This experience was a life changer, set me on a new career path, what I'm doing today. Do you know that two out of five dislike their colleagues? We're approximately 600 persons here tonight. It means that, yes, 240 of you don't like your colleagues. Don't raise your hands, no. And in fact, a woman came up to me after one of my shows, and she was quite impressed. She said, two out of five? Well, in my department, it's five out of five. No one can stand each other. So their goal was to work down to two out of five. Sounds like a plan. But on the flip side, it's a good thing, because it means that we have opinions about how people conduct their work. We have standards and values that we bring into our workplace, and that means that we care. In average, I visit about 150 workplaces every year, try to learn and understand what makes great cultures great and why so many companies struggle. And in the research for my book, Irritating Colleagues, I made a survey. One simple question. What do you find irritating about your colleagues? It turns out there are no limits in what we find annoying. Hitting the keyboard too hard, talking too loud, laughing too hard, smiling all the time, never smiling. This was only a small part of what came out in the survey. The smell of a coworker eating mackerel in tomato is obviously a huge problem. Another one, hated people eating yogurt for 10 minutes, spending eight of them getting out the two last drops with the spoon. <laughs> that sound drives me crazy. And one even told me she had an irritating colleague 
because she was wearing her scarf in an irritating way in meetings. Yep, going to work every day is definitely not for the faint-hearted. Cram people who irritate each other into a confined space, eight hours a day, giving them difficult tasks, appoint a mediocre manager, rattle the cage with a well-placed reorg, and voila, a recipe for disaster. Navigating this landscape seems like an impossible task. In the business world, we agree, the greatest asset are the people who work there, how they collaborate and how they interact. But no one has written a user manual for the people who are not like us. But if such a manual existed, would you take the time to read it? Not only the troubleshooting part and the quick fix guide, but the whole manual. Perhaps your colleagues would recommend that you did. I made it my mission to create such a manual, and I started to identify the different types. And the toughest one is the prima donna. Highly skilled employee, super performer, best of the best, and they know it. Sets the bar high for not only themselves, but for everyone. It's not a job, it's a calling. And yes, they are so annoying. But if you stop to think, you realize they're a huge asset. What about Mr. Know-it-all? I loved your presentation this morning, but I would like to give you a piece of advice. <laughs> or if I were you, oh, I can't remember my mom working here. Yet we are all looking to develop our skills. Am I right or am I right? And there are more. Not that I'm surprised, but the boss was quite happy with my performance today. Yeah. Say hello to the braggart, the one who always brags in front of everyone else about their achievements. I feel so energized after my 10K run, 6 a.m. this morning. <laughs> These guys should work in the army, you know, medals, degrees, feathers, wings, ropes, the whole shebang on display on their uniform. Imagine if uh, plumbers had their uh, badge of honor on their jackets. The clogged toilet award 2022, yeah. Sometimes you get two opposing forces in the workplace. The super optimist meets the pessimist. Monday, new week, full of opportunities. Monday, five days with problems. Seminar, love to learn new stuff. Seminar, probably heard it before. A while back I was hired by a company. They needed help with improving their culture. They had already come up with a couple of uh, suggestions themselves, um, and one of them, from a super optimist, was to swap lunch boxes with a random colleague <laughs> once a week. To get to know and understand each other, yeah, maybe become friends. The pessimist refused, said no. I wasn't hired to swap lunch boxes once a week. And he added, do we really need all these wine lotteries and waffle Fridays and another kickoff with childish and stupid team building activities and games in a remote cabin somewhere? They are both right. And then the saboteur throws himself into the mix, always recruiting members to the internal trade union with regular daily meetings by the coffee machine, embracing this satisfaction. Mentally, these people don't work here anymore. They don't brighten up the room when they arrive, but they sure do when they leave. And on their way out, they meet the free rider who doesn't care about anything. Their only motivation seems to be to yeah, pick up their monthly salary for doing nothing. You can change people, but you can change the way you perceive them and how you relate to them. I want to take you back to a freezing cold January day in northern Norway. 200 people gathered in a big hall, difficult reorg finalized, bad atmosphere in the room. I was hired to lift their spirits. <laughs> tough crowd, tough gig. I gave them one assignment. Write down one positive thing 
that has happened to you in the workplace the last year. Talk to the person next to you. Reflect 10 minutes. I walked around. Sparks didn't fly. Time's up. I see two elderly gentlemen sitting here. One of them is in tears. And I ask the guy, not crying, what happened? Well, things got a bit emotional, he says. And I ask him to share his thoughts with the, the rest of us. And finally, he says, okay, tough guy. He walks up on the stage, he checks the microphone, and he says, one year ago, I got a stroke. The doctors told me that I should have been dead. But here I am. After a couple of months, I came back on work, gave me a sense of purpose, visiting the workplace, getting back to life. And all of you um, that knew me, you came by, fine, for a chat, okay. But what impressed me the most were all of you that I didn't know or didn't like, a couple of you I couldn't stand. You were the ones who paid me most attention, who cared for me, gave me love. He looks up, 200 persons in, in tears. A bit embarrassed, he says, stop crying, you fools. But do we all need a stroke before we understand that everyone here are great people? The room exploded. Everyone stood up. Unforgettable moment. I think he had a point. I don't think we have idiots at work, but we do have people who are different from ourselves. Thank God. I want to make a suggestion. Imagine you had to defend as a lawyer the one colleague you dislike the most in a court of law. Write down everything that is great about this person, both professionally and personally, skills, traits, qualities. I guarantee you will find something worth appreciating. If you dare to change your mind, it's like a miracle pill for your mental state. So much energy is wasted on conflicts and annoyance in the workplace. So many great ideas are never heard. So much talent is overlooked. How much more could we achieve if we embrace the people who are not like us? And this is only in the workplace. Today we have bigger and more important challenges. War, global warming, energy crisis, pandemics. Are we open to the people who are not like us? Do we appreciate both the Muslim and the Christian? Do we hear the idea put forward by the Democrat and the Republican? Do we see the value in both the skeptic and the scientist in our society? Perhaps these world issues are out of reach for us sitting here, but we can all start in our own workplace by being determined to see the value in all our colleagues, even the ones who eat mackerel in tomato for lunch. Thank you.